This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. A little controversy today. Somehow or another, by the magic of you know what, I will connect COVID, Dr. Fauci, vaccinations, fundamentals, and trend following all together in one big stew. But first, I want to play a clip from a young 10 year old boy in the state of Florida. Now, again, as I said from the top, this will be a little controversial today. But if you just stay with me, you're going to find out that I'm not picking a side. I don't give a shit about a side. But I do care about the data, the truth, the facts. That's what I'm after. Back to the 10-year-old boy. He is at a public meeting in the state of Florida. I think he's addressing a school board. Bear with me and listen to this couple-minute clip. I will come back and I will tie everything together. Turned 10 years old. Just talk a little closer to that. So I just turned 10 years old and I am a fourth grader at Felix A. Williams. I expected school to be a little bit different in the beginning, but I didn't think it would stay this way all year long. And I was surprised by the rules. A lot of them didn't make any sense to me, like the fact that we were not allowed to play on the playground or have student council or turn to face each other at lunch. And we also have to wear masks outside at PE and on track. I love my school and all, but my teachers seem really stressed, and that makes me feel bad. One teacher walks around with a clipboard full of referrals for any student whose mask isn't on properly. It makes me feel scared. That same teacher yells at us having our masks down to drink water while we are outside in Carline. She told us we had to wait until we were in our parents' car to have a drink of water. She had her mask down the entire time while she was yelling at us, which makes me and all my friends very mad. This happens a lot. And it seems unfair teachers take their masks off while they're yell while they yell at us kids and that we need to pull ours up. I asked my mom if there is a word for this, and she said there is. Hypocrisy. Wearing a mask all day makes me feel really tired and gives me really bad headaches. Sometimes I'm at school and I need to lay low in the dark until they're gone. My mask also sticks to my face when it's really hot, and it makes it hard to breathe. I feel like I can't catch my breath, and that makes me feel claustrophobic and anxious. It's really stressful. I finished taking all of my FSAs and I had a hard time focusing with a mask on. A few weeks ago, I ran into my teacher outside of school. She didn't even recognize me because she's never seen my face before. But I knew it was her because she sits at her desk a lot without a mask on. I know my teacher has asthma and everything, but I understand why it's hard for her to wear a mask. And I think she should have that choice. But I should too. I have allergies, and I feel really anxious with my face covered. But I'm not allowed a mask break like her. It seems unfair. All this seems unfair, and it doesn't make sense. I miss seeing people's face. I miss the way things used to be. I'm scared they'll never go back to normal. Breathing freely doesn't seem like something we should have to ask any other people for permission for. Please make masks optional today. It would be so awesome to end the school year on a really happy note like that. Thank you for your time. Thank you, John. You did a good job. <laughs> now, before I go ahead and connect some of the dots, let me add a few more data points. Dr. Fauci, who is the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the United States of America, the Dr. Fauci that everyone has heard about, he recently appeared before Congress, and I think he was wearing a mask. And Rand Paul, the senator, accused him of mask theater. Fauci assured him that was not the case and that the mask was useful. Now, I got to tell you, I've worn a mask a lot in the last year and a half. I'm not in America. I'm not questioning it that much because the culture is accepting and masks in Asia in general during flu season is kind of normal. So it's not such a big deal. 
But to keep adding to the Rand Paul and Fauci and Fauci saying, no, the mask is useful. Not but a few weeks later, Fauci admits that the mask does not need to be worn in America. And it is signaling, meaning it was a signal. It was not necessarily the truth, what he was saying. Now, to connect that in with the little kid that I just played the clip of before I connect it all back to trend following and the fundamentals, the little kid would make a great scientist because essentially he was being skeptical. He was not believing what the adults were telling him to do. Because if you're a little 10-year-old kid and you're told you have to wear the mask, but your perhaps obese teacher is sitting in the front of the classroom, no mask, well, even a 10-year-old kid knows that's bullshit. Now, those that are playing along at home can probably already start to see where I'm going here. You got the 10-year-old kid who's the skeptic. He sees there's a problem. You got the guy that knows all about the scientific method more than most people, Dr. Fauci, who's giving all kinds of information that doesn't really make a lot of sense. One more Dr. Fauci point. As of this moment in time, his institute, his government institute, the one that studies infectious diseases, Dr. Fauci just admitted that only 50 to 60% of his people have taken a vaccine. Now, what would the 10-year-old boy say about that? Well, hold on. All of America's got to get a vaccine, but the people who specialize in the infectious diseases are not taking the vaccine? Well, why is that? What's that mean? Now, this stream of consciousness I'm throwing at you today is just that. It's the skeptic. I'm sitting here and I'm looking at all these different data points and I'm saying, this doesn't make any sense, right? I'm on the side of the little 10-year-old kid, the skeptic. I've always been a skeptic. I would have given that exact same speech at 10. Maybe I wasn't smart enough to write it, but I would have given that same speech. And I think that 10-year-old kid, and here's the pivot to fundamentals and trend following, and I think that 10-year-old kid would also understand that if somebody tells you, buy crypto because of XYZ fundamental, this will happen in the future, or sell oil because this will happen. That same 10-year-old kid is going to say, well, hold on. How do you know? Well, that's a good question. You don't know. So if you don't know, and the people who are experts seem to be full of shit or hypocritical or just, you know, bad-looking actors, well, then you need to do something else. So now it's a little tough with COVID and vaccines. I'll grant you that. It's a little less clear as to what you are able to do versus the markets. But when it comes to the fundamentals, I mean, seriously, don't give me the fundamentals for crypto. You're just whistling nonsense. There are no fundamentals for crypto. But that doesn't mean crypto can't make you a lot of money. The point is you have to have a strategy that's not based on the fundamentals. Because once you're not caught up in trying to believe, I must believe like David Duchovny in the X-Files. Now, I love the X-Files, but I want to believe is the mantra of the fundamentalist. The trend following trader doesn't say, I want to believe. The trend following trader says, like that 10-year-old kid, what's the data? Let me use the data right now to make a decision. That's the trend following mindset. So I think we're really lucky to have a young boy like that go ahead and ask questions. Because the intelligent of you and my audience are realizing that he's not just talking about COVID. He's not just talking about masks or vaccinations. He's talking about any subject, any subject where you see authority figures operating under hypocrisy. Because you know, every smart individual knows that when you see an authority figure using hypocrisy, it's just bullshit. And you have to go the other way. You won't be able to live with yourself. Now, if you're a lemming, if you're a fool, if you just trust whoever, well, you'll be fine with it all. 
But if you're like that 10 year old kid and you don't trust the system, you don't trust the fundamentals, you need to have a strategy for dealing with uncertainty. You need to have a strategy for dealing with the real data. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what trend following is all about. So to reward you today for listening to my mini rant, connecting all of these seemingly disparate subjects into one fine bowl of soup, pho, as we might say in Vietnam, to reward you, I'm going to play the audiobook version of chapter four of my book, The Complete Turtle Trader. This was a chapter I titled The Philosophy because it gets into the philosophy of why trend following works. It gets into the philosophy, starting with the scientific method of why that 10 year old boy deserves a medal and Fauci doesn't. And that's true. We all know it's true. Now, some of you can't admit it because some of you like to kiss ass. Now, a lot of my audience, of course, they don't kiss ass. So they will love that 10 year old boy just like me. Without any further delay, let's jump right into chapter four of my book, The Complete Turtle Trader, where I get into the philosophy behind trend following, the philosophy behind turtle trend following. A lot of this philosophy inspired by the famed trader, William Eckhart. William Eckhart famously did not think that Rich Dennis could train traders to become these famous turtle traders. Eckhart thought it was not going to work. Well, he learned that it did work. But here's the funny thing. During the training process, it was Bill Eckhart who did most of the training. So even though he had that one little bet wrong, Bill Eckhart, a very brilliant guy with a hell of a lot of success. Let's jump right into chapter four of my book, The Complete Turtle Trader on audiobook. Chapter 4. The Philosophy When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes Dennis and Eckhart's two weeks of training were heavy with the scientific method, the structural foundation of their trading style, and the foundation on which they had based their arguments in high school. It was the same foundation relied upon by Hume and Locke. Simply put, the scientific method is a set of techniques for investigating phenomena and acquiring new knowledge, as well as for correcting and integrating previous knowledge. It is based on observable, empirical, measurable evidence, and subject to laws of reasoning. It involves seven steps. 1. Define the question. 2. Gather information and resources. 3. Form hypothesis. 4. Perform experiment and collect data. 5. Analyze data. 6. Interpret data and draw conclusions that serve as a starting point for new hypotheses. 7. Publish results. This is not the type of discussion you will hear on CNBC or have with your local broker when he calls with a daily hot tip. Such pragmatic thinking lacks the sizzle and punch of get rich quick advice. Dennis and Eckhart were adamant that their students consider themselves scientists first and traders second, a testament to their belief in doing the right thing. The empiricist Dennis knew that plugging along without a solid philosophical foundation was perilous. He never wanted his research to be just numbers bouncing around in a computer. There had to be a theory, and then the numbers could be used to confirm it. He said, I think you need the conceptual apparatus to be the first thing you start with and the last thing you look at. This thinking put Dennis way ahead of his time. Years later, the academic Daniel Kahneman would win a Nobel Prize for Prospect Theory, Behavioral Finance, a fancy name for what Dennis was actually doing for a living and teaching his turtles. Avoiding the psychological voltage that routinely sank so many other traders was mandatory for the turtles. The techniques that Dennis and Eckhart taught the turtles were different from Dennis's seasonal spread techniques from his early floor days. 
the turtles were trained to be trend-following traders. In a nutshell, that meant that they needed a trend to make money. Trend followers always wait for a market to move, then they follow it. Capturing the majority of a trend, up or down, for profit is the goal. The turtles were trained this way because by 1983, Dennis knew the things that worked best were rules. The majority of the other things that didn't work were judgments. It seemed that the better part of the whole thing was rules. You can't wake up in the morning and say, I want to have an intuition about a market. You're going to have way too many judgments. While Dennis knew exactly where the sweet spot was for making big money, he often fumbled his own trading with too many discretionary judgments. Looking back, he blamed his pit experience, saying, People trading in the pit are very bad systems traders generally. They learn different things. They react to the price tick in your face. Dennis and Eckhart did not invent trend following. From the 1950s into the 1970s, there was one preeminent trend trader with years of positive performance, Richard Donchian. Donchian was the undisputed father of trend following. He spoke and wrote profusely on the subject. He influenced Dennis and Eckhart and just about every other technically-minded trader with a pulse. One of Donchian's students, Barbara Dixon, described trend followers as making no attempt to forecast the extent of a price move. The trend follower disciplines his thoughts into a strict set of conditions for entering and exiting the market and acts on those rules or his system to the exclusion of all other market factors. This removes, hopefully, emotional judgmental influences from individual market decisions. Trend traders don't expect to be right every time. In fact, on individual trades, they admit when they are wrong, take their losses, and move on. However, they do expect to make money over the long run. In 1960, Donchin reduced this philosophy to what he called his weekly trading rule. The rule was brutally utilitarian. When the price moves above the high of two previous calendar weeks, the optimum number of weeks varies by commodity, cover your short positions and buy. When the price breaks below the low of the two previous calendar weeks, liquidate your long position and sell short. Richard Dennis's protege, Tom Willis, had learned long ago from Dennis why price, the philosophical underpinning of Donchian's rule, was the only true metric to trust. He said, everything known is reflected in the price. I could never hope to compete with Cargill, today the world's second largest private corporation, with $70 billion in revenues for 2005, who has soybean agents scouring the globe knowing everything there is to know about soybeans and funneling the information up to their trading headquarters. Willis has had friends who made millions trading fundamentally, but they could never know as much as the big corporations with thousands of employees and they always limited themselves to trading only one market. Willis added, They don't know anything about bonds. They don't know anything about the currencies. I don't either, but I've made a lot of money trading them. They're just numbers. Corn is a little different than bonds, but not different enough that I'd have to trade them differently. Some of these guys I read about have a different system for each market. That's absurd. We're trading mob psychology. We're not trading corn, soybeans, or S&Ps. We're trading numbers. Trading numbers was just another Dennis convention to reinforce abstracting the world in order not to get emotionally distracted. Dennis made the turtles understand price analysis. He did this because at first he thought that intelligence was reality and price the appearance. But after a while, I saw that price is the reality and intelligence is the appearance. He was not being purposefully oblique. Dennis's working assumption was that soybean prices reflected soybean news faster than people could get and digest the news. Since his early 20s, he had known that looking at the news for decision-making cues was the wrong thing to do. If acting on news, stock tips, and economic reports were the real key to trading success, then everyone would be rich. Dennis was blunt. Abstractions like crop size, unemployment, and inflation are mere metaphysics to the trader. 
They don't help you predict prices, and they may not even explain past market action. The greatest trader in Chicago had been trading five years before he ever saw a soybean. He poked fun at the notion that if something was happening in the weather, his trading would somehow change. If it's raining on those soybeans, all that means to me is I should bring an umbrella. Turtles may have initially heard Dennis's explanations and assumed he was just being cute or coy, but in reality he was telling them exactly how to think. He wanted the turtles to know, in their heart of hearts, the downsides of fundamental analysis. You don't get any profit from fundamental analysis. You get profit from buying and selling. So why stick with the appearance when you can go right to the reality of price? How could the turtles possibly know the balance sheets and assorted other financial metrics of all 500 companies in the S&P 500 index? Or how could they know all the fundamentals about soybeans? They couldn't. Even if they did, that knowledge would not have told them when to buy or sell, along with how much to buy or sell. Dennis knew he had problems if watching TV allowed people to predict what would happen tomorrow, or predict anything for that matter. He said, if the universe is structured like that, I'm in trouble. Fundamental reporting from CNBC's Maria Bartiromo would have been called fluff by the CND Commodities teaching team. Michael Gibbons, a trend-following trader, put using news for trading decisions in perspective. I stopped looking at news as something important in 1978. A good friend of mine was employed as a reporter by the largest commodity news service at the time. One day his major story was about sugar and what it was going to do. After I read his piece, I asked, How do you know all of this? I will never forget his answer. He said, I made it up. However, trading a la Dennis was not all highs. Regular small losses were going to happen as the turtles traded Dennis's money. Dennis knew the role confidence would play. He said, I suppose I didn't like the idea that everyone thought I was all wrong, crazy, or going to fail. But it didn't make any substantial difference because I had an idea what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. The Turtles' core axioms were the same ones practiced by the great speculators from 100 years earlier. Do not let emotions fluctuate with the up and down of your capital. Be consistent and even tempered. Judge yourself not by the outcome but by your process. Know what you are going to do when the market does what it is going to do. Every now and then, the impossible can and will happen. Know each day what your plan and your contingencies are for the next day. What can I win and what can I lose? What are the probabilities of either happening? However, there was precision behind the familiar-sounding euphemisms. From the first day of training, William Eckhart outlined five questions that were relevant to what he called an optimal trade. The Turtles had to be able to answer these questions at all times. 1. What is the state of the market? 2. What is the volatility of the market? 3. What is the equity being traded? 4. What is the system or the trading orientation? 5. What is the risk aversion of the trader or client? There was no messing around in Eckhart's tone as he suggested that these were the only things that had any importance. What is the state of the market? The state of the market simply means, what is the price that the market is trading at? If Microsoft is trading at 40 a share today, then that is the state of that market. What is the volatility of the market? Eckhart taught the turtles that they had to know on a daily basis how much any market goes up and down. If Microsoft on an average trades at 50, but typically bounces up and down on any given day between 48 and 52, then the turtles were taught that the volatility of that market was 4. They had their own jargon to describe daily volatilities. They would say that Microsoft had an N of 4. More volatile markets generally carried more risk. What is the equity being traded? The turtles had to know how much money they had at all times because every rule they would learn adapted to their given account size at that moment. What is the system or the trading orientation? 
Eckhart instructed the turtles that in advance of the market opening, they had to have their battle plans set for buying and selling. They couldn't say, Okay, I've got $100,000, I'm going to randomly decide to trade 5000 of it. Eckhart did not want them to wake up and say, Do I buy if Google hits 500 or do I sell if Google hits 500 They were taught precise rules that would tell them when to buy or sell any market at any time based on the movement of the price. The Turtles had two systems, System 1, S1, and System 2, S2. These systems governed their entries and exits. S1 essentially said you would buy or sell short a market if it made a new 20-day high or low. What is the risk aversion of the trader or client? Risk management was not a concept that the traders grasped immediately. For example, if they had $10,000 in their account, should they bet all $10,000 on Google stock? No. If Google all of a sudden dropped, they could lose all $10,000 fast. They had to bet a small amount of the $10,000 because they didn't know whether or not a trade was going to go in their favor. Small betting, for example 2% of $10,000 on initial bets, kept them in the game to play another day, all the while waiting for a big trend. Class Discussion Day after day, Eckhart would emphasize comparisons. Once he told the Turtles to consider two traders who have the same equity, the same system, or trading orientation, and the same risk aversion, and were both facing the same situation in the market. For both traders, the optimal course of action must be the same. Whatever is optimal for one should be optimal for the other, he would say. Now, this may sound simple, but human nature causes most people, when faced with a similar situation, to react differently. They tend to outthink the situation, figuring there must be some unique value that they alone can add to make it even better. Dennis and Eckhart demanded that the turtles respond the same or they were out of the program. They did end up cutting people. In essence, Eckhart was saying, You are not special. You are not smarter than the market. So follow the rules. Whoever you are and however much brains you have, it doesn't make a hill of beans difference. Because if you're facing the same issues and if you've got the same constraints, you must follow the same rules. Eckhart said this in a far nicer, more professional and academic way, but that was what he meant. He did not want his students to wake up and say, I'm feeling smart today, I'm feeling lucky today, or I'm feeling dumb today. He taught them to wake up and say, I'll do what my rules say to do today. Dennis was clear that it would take stick to to follow the rules day to day and do it right. To follow the good principles and not let fear, greed, and hope interfere with your trading is tough. You're swimming upstream against human nature. The turtles had to have the confidence to follow through on all rules and pull the trigger when they were supposed to. Hesitate, and they would be toast in the zero-sum market game. This motley crew of novices quickly learned that of the five questions deemed to be most important by Eckhart, the first two, about the market's state and the market's volatility, were the objective pieces of the puzzle. Those were simply facts that everyone could see plain as day. Eckhart was most interested in the last three questions, which addressed the equity level, the systems, and the risk aversion. They were subjective questions all grounded in the present. It did not make a difference what the answers to these three questions were a month ago or last week. Only right now was important. Put another way, the turtles could control only how much money they had now, how they decided to enter and exit a trade now, and how much to risk on each trade right now. For example, if Google is trading at 500 today, Google is trading at 500. That's a statement of fact. If Google has a precise volatility, N, today of 4, that's not a judgment call. To reinforce the need for objectivity on issues such as N, Eckhart wanted the turtles to think in terms of memory-less trading. He told them, You shouldn't care about how you got to the current state, 
but rather about what you should do now. A trader who trades differently because of swings in confidence is focusing on his or her own past rather than on current realities. If five years ago you had $100,000 and today you only have $50,000, you can't sit around and make decisions based on the hypothetical $100,000 you used to have. You have to base your decisions on the reality of the $50,000 you have now. How to handle profits properly is a separation point between winners and losers. Great traders adjust their trading to the money they have at any one time. If crude oil had just traded above $40 for the first time, the turtles were not to sit around and kibitz about it. They were to take action if it hit their S1 or S2 entry or exit signals. Why or how it got to $40 was irrelevant. Eckhart threw out the examples fast and furious. He started with a commonplace idea that most people are willing to accept. If you make some profits with your original money, you can take more risks because now you're playing with their money. He said, It's certainly a comforting thought. It certainly can't be as bad to lose their money as yours, can't it? Why should it matter whom the money used to belong to? What matters is whom it belongs to now, you, and what to do about it now. For instance, assume you start with a $100,000 account, quickly making another $100,000. You now have $200,000. Although you made a profit, you can't say, I can now take crazier risks with that $100,000. Why would you view your money as funny money or lucky money? The turtles were taught to treat that additional $100,000 as they did their original $100,000 they had to use the same concern, care, and discipline. The five questions didn't change, even if their account balances did. Traders who face the same opportunity must trade the same. Personal feelings can't interfere. Pretend there are two traders, John and Mary. John and Mary are exactly alike in all respects. They have the same risk aversion and the same system, there is one small difference between the two. John has 50% more money. John then decides to go on vacation, and while he's away having fun at South Beach, Mary makes 50%. Now they have exactly the same amount of money. How or why they got to the point of having the same amount of money is not relevant. The correct course for John is the correct course for Mary. Eckhart did not want the turtles to say, I had a period where I made some money, so now I can do something different. They had to take the same steps regardless. Logically, upon first hearing that Mary had just made 50% more, most people might want to debate Eckhart's contention that they should trade the same way. The rule was designed to keep traders with a big profit run-up in their trading account from acting irrationally or breaking a rule. Many people with a big profit run-up don't want to lose those paper gains. They are anxious to take their profits off the table so they can feel secure. Eckhart slammed home the point that the security craved by humans was bad for proper trading. The distinction between open trade equity and closed-out trading profits is completely vacuous. How much do you have in open trade equity? How much do you have in closed-out equity? This is a bookkeeper's artifact, it has absolutely no relevance to correct trading. While it might have zero relevance, people go the wrong way all the time. Instead of trading as they should today, based on their money now and their rules, they trade based on the money they once had. They are clearly trying to recoup. How much money you used to have has no significance. It's how much money you have now, implored Eckhart. If the turtle started with $100,000 but now had $90,000, they still had to make trading decisions based on what they had now. If the turtles were supposed to risk 2% of their trading capital, then they had to risk 2% of their current $90,000, not 2% of their original $100,000. If the turtles lost money in a market, they had to move on. Accepting and managing losses are part of their game. 
The whole notion of holding on to the past was a big issue for the team at C&D Commodities. Eckhart was stern about the mistake losing traders make when they look backward in time. The losing trader is trying to make money back in the same market and on the same position. Eckhart described it as a market vendetta. Suppose John lost money in Cisco. That market hurt him. Instead of focusing on what the best opportunity might be now, he wants his money back in Cisco. All John can think about is his Cisco position, and in turn his loss just keeps growing. According to Eckhart, this is the kind of personal memory mistake that always leads to disaster. The Turtles were taught not to fixate on what particular market made money that month or year or what market lost money. They learn to be agnostic and accept whatever trending market created opportunity. The same principle was seen with losses. For example, when the turtles were taught that they had to exit with a small loss because they don't know how far it could drop, they got out. What they didn't want to do was look at the initial small loss and say, I had $100,000 of Microsoft, and now I have $90,000, so I'm going to put another $10,000 of my money into MSFT because now it's cheap. Dennis said that to add to a losing position was like being the kid who's been burned on a hot stove once already, but puts his hand back on the stove just to prove it was the stove that was wrong. However, that said, if after taking a small loss, the turtle got a signal to get into the market again, they got back in. An example using legendary hedge fund manager Paul Tudor Jones best explains the point. In one of Jones's best trades, he got an entry signal. He got in. The trade went against him and he lost 2%, forcing him to get out. All of a sudden, the entry signal came right back as the market moved in his favor again. He could not debate it. He had to get back in. Then it went against him again for another 2% loss forcing him to get out again. He went through this process ten or so times in a row until he got a position that actually kept trending. That final big trend made enough money to pay for all those false starts and then some, but to get there in the first place he had to follow his rules religiously. The same lesson is seen in sports. Even though Larry Bird was one of the best basketball three-point shooters ever, he wasn't perfect. Let's say on average he hit 40% of his three-point shots. But if all of a sudden he went on a streak where he missed 15 in a row, what did that mean? Could Bird afford to stop taking three-point shots? No. That was what Dennis and Eckhart were teaching. Another great example of the statistical mindset Dennis and Eckhart were teaching the Turtles can be found in baseball. Assume you bat 300 for 10 years straight. All of a sudden, you go zero for 25. Does that mean you are no longer a 300 batter? No. It means you still have to go up to the plate and swing like you've always swung, because that's the discipline of being a 300 hitter. The Turtles played the odds for the long haul. The Turtles were taught not to fixate on when they entered a market. They were taught to worry about when they will exit. Pretend again there are two traders, John and Mary. They are exactly the same except in the amount of trading capital each of them has. Assume John has 10% less money, but enters a trade before Mary. By the time Mary gets in her trade, they both have the same amount of money, Eckhart clarified. What this means is that once an initiation is made, it should not matter at all to subsequent decisions what the initiation price was. He wanted the turtles to literally trade as though they didn't know what their entry price was. Dennis kept bringing his teachings back to losses. The trader who is averse to losses is in the wrong business. The secret was what he did with the wrong positions, not with the right ones. Managing the losing trades, what Dennis called the wrong positions, allowed traders to wait for the right ones, big trends. This is why the entry price was only so important. What Dennis and Eckhart were teaching was the exact opposite of Warren Buffett's buying value. The turtles were supposed to say, I want to buy or sell short markets that are in motion, moving up and down, because markets in motion tend to stay in motion. 
If markets are moving higher, that's a good thing. If markets are moving lower, that's a good thing too. Dennis and Eckhart wanted the turtles to profit from both. Dennis was pushing his students to go against basic human nature. He said, The single hardest thing I have to do to make people understand how I trade is to convince them how wrong I can be about things, how much of a guess it is. They think that there's some magic involved and that it's not just trial and error. C&D's trading inspired a great deal of mystification, but in reality they were a mass merchandiser who sold 90% of their products as loss leaders so they could make a gigantic profit on the remaining 10%. Sometimes they had to wait a long time for good things to happen. Most people can't psychologically handle the wait. Look at this logic from a media company perspective. Like Dennis and Eckhart, movie producers and publishing executives know they will have losers. A movie studio will fund 10 movies. A book publisher will fund 10 books. In both cases, the producers or publishers often have no idea which one exactly of the 10 is going to be successful. In fact, they might be lucky if one of the 10 is successful. Since they don't know which one is going to be successful, they still have to fund all 10. If nine of those books aren't successful, well, the publisher is only going to print a small batch to begin with. That equals a small loss. If those movies or books don't do well, fine, they're done. The companies cut their losses and get out. However, the movie or book that does really well, the tenth one, pays for the losses from the nine losers. The Turtles were taught to think of themselves as the publisher, the movie studio, or the casino house. Don't try to predict how long a trend either up or down will last. It is impossible. Eckhart gave the Turtles an example of a market moving rapidly through the point where they were supposed to buy, but for whatever reason had missed. Now they were sitting there waiting for a retracement. While they wait for the cheap place to buy, the market keeps racing higher and higher. Eckhart said there was a great temptation to reason that now it's too high to buy. If you buy it now, you'll have an initiation price that's too high. However, it is imperative that you make this trade. The initiation price simply won't have the kind of significance you suppose it will have after the trade is made. The turtles were not to wait for a retracement. There was no statistical justification to think like that. If they were trading soybeans at $8 and they went to $9, the turtles were taught to buy them at $9 rather than wait for them to retrace to $8 they might never retrace to $8. How would the turtles have acted if they'd received a buy signal for Google for the first time at $500? They would buy. Get on board now was the thinking. Dennis always came back to the scientific method, saying that when you have a position, you put it on for a reason and you've got to keep it on until the reason no longer exists. You have to have a strategy to trade, know how it works, and follow through on it. There is a flip side to this mentality, however. For example, on Wednesday, November 22, 2006, Google opened the day at over $510 a share. Within five days, by Wednesday the 29th, Google was trading at $483, which means Google had pulled back nearly 30 points. When it got to $510, could you know it was going to keep going up or that it was going to go down? You couldn't know either way. What could you do? All you could do was let the price tell you what to do. Eckhart was teaching math and rules to manage the emotions felt in the face of uncertainty. He said, Are you involved in emotional personal memories as opposed to objective knowledge? What I'm advising against is letting factors that are personal, emotional, and idiosyncratic to your own history influence your trading. Measuring volatility was critical for the turtles. Most people then and today ignore it in their trading. The question Dennis and Eckhart always asked was, how big should you trade based on current volatility? In other words, it's not so much the current price of a given stock or futures contract that is paramount, but rather knowing at all times the market's volatility. For example, 
It's important to know that Microsoft is at a price level of 40 today, but it's even more important to know Microsoft's volatility, N, now, so you can buy or sell short the right amount of Microsoft based on your limited capital. Near the end of the breakneck training, Dennis and Eckhart reiterated the obvious to their newly trained turtles. The successful students in the class would be the ones who followed the rules and did not deviate. They did not want creative geniuses. It must have been ego-deflating for turtles once they realized. What Dennis and Eckhart were looking for was the equivalent of robots. Investor Bradley Rotter, who has been called the very first investor with Dennis, saw their conundrum. Applaud the genius of Richard Dennis. The program was well put together. It was focused on discipline. It didn't matter if a trade felt good or felt bad. They just had to do it. It was a very, a very simplistic trend-following system that had an aggressive matrix to add to winning positions and subtract from losing positions, and all those people who are very successful are those who just followed the formula and did not deviate. Note, for some readers, Chapter 4 will be the only chapter on the turtle philosophy and rules worth examining. This book has been designed in such a way that you can continue and dive into the math that makes up the exact turtle trading rules in Chapter 5, while the casual reader can jump ahead to Chapter 6 without skipping a beat. For those interested in reading Chapter 5, the following basic Wall Street terms from wikipedia.com should be assumed. Long. One who has bought futures contracts or owns a cash commodity. Short. Noun. One who has sold futures contracts or plans to purchase a cash commodity. Short. Verb. To sell futures contracts or initiate a cash-forward contract sale without offsetting a particular market position. Short selling or shorting is a way to profit from the decline in price of a security, such as a stock or a bond. Most investors go long on an investment, hoping that price will rise. To profit from the stock price going down, a short seller can borrow a security and sell it, expecting that it will decrease in value so that he can buy it back at a lower price and keep the difference. Volatility A measurement of the change in price over a given period. Futures contract A standardized contract traded on a futures exchange to buy or sell a certain underlying instrument at a certain date in the future at a specified price. The future date is called the delivery date or final settlement date. The preset price is called the futures price. The price of the underlying asset on the delivery date is called the settlement price. The settlement price normally converges toward the futures price on the delivery date. Both parties of a futures contract must fulfill the contract on the settlement date. The seller delivers the commodity to the buyer or, if it is a cash-settled future, then cash is transferred from the futures trader who sustained a loss to the one who made a profit. To exit the commitment prior to the settlement date, the holder of a futures position has to offset his position by either selling a long position or buying back a short position, effectively closing out the futures position and its contract obligations. Futures contracts, or simply futures, are exchange-traded derivatives. Market order. A buy or sell order to be executed by the broker immediately at current market prices. As long as there are willing sellers and buyers, a market order will be filled. Stop order, sometimes known as a stop-loss order. The complement of a limit order. It is an order to buy or sell a security once the price of the security has climbed above or dropped below a specified price known as the stop price. When the specified price is reached, the stop order is entered as a market order. Moving average. In finance, and especially in technical analysis, one of a family of similar statistical techniques used to analyze time series data. A moving average series can be calculated for any time series, but is most often applied to stock prices, returns, or trading volumes. Moving averages are used to smooth out short-term fluctuations, thus highlighting longer-term trends or cycles. I want to interject a little extra understanding about chapters four and five of this book. 
Chapter 4 outlines the philosophy, arguably even the rules. But chapter 5 was unique. Chapter 5 is the math, the exact rules that you will need to execute and trade as a trend-following trader. But this book was designed that if you don't want to know all of the exact rules right now, you can skip chapter 5 and go to chapter 6. But for those of you that want the full story, I know you're not going to skip any chapter. You're going to go from chapter 4 to chapter 5 to chapter 6, and that's just the way it is, and that's the way that it should be. But for those of you that are feeling a little wimpy, you can skip chapter 5 and still take away from this story a tremendous amount of insight. Now jump back in. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.